Neural efficiency is an aspect of strength and performance that often goes overlooked. However, it is absolutely critical if you want to be able to use your strength in a practical setting, and it does absolute wonders for agility too. Let's see why neural efficiency may be the missing link in your training and how it relates to fascia and dynamical systems theory to result in virtuous, dynamic, coordinated demonstrations of strength and power. The mistake many make with functional training is to train muscle groups in isolation. The belief is that if you strengthen all the muscles that are used in a particular movement, then the individual will be able to perform that movement with more strength. In reality, this is not always the case. The example we have often given on this channel is the martial artist who can punch with significantly more force and power than a bodybuilder or powerlifter, despite those athletes being ostensibly stronger. Just because the bodybuilder has stronger pecs, delts and triceps, that doesn't mean they can throw a powerful punch. Partly, this is because they may have trained in a less explosive manner. Partly, it's because they may have missed the rotational muscles, such as the obliques and serratus muscles. But on top of that, it is because they haven't trained the muscles together, and in that order, the martial artist has. Doing this has caused changes in the martial artist's brain. They've repeatedly used the same network of brain cells that send signals to the right muscles in the right order. As such, those brain cells have become ingrained through processes such as myelination, the coating of axons to insulate the neurons. The pattern of activation in the brain directly corresponds with the pattern of activation in the body. And for the athlete, the signal is stronger and much more efficient. There is less overspill to neighboring areas, meaning that only the useful muscles are activated, helping to relax antagonistic forces and reduce energy expenditure. And more muscle fibers are recruited in the relevant muscles. This is neural efficiency in motor skill, and it correlates with strength, agility, speed, and general performance. This then raises a question. For the functional athlete, is the bench press the most useful movement they could perform? Let's consider a wrestler for a moment, or a rugby player. These are athletes that are required to push opponents. Bench press develops muscles useful for horizontal pushing, so it's great, right? Well, here's the issue. When you push a person or an object in real life, you don't push them while lying flat on your back. Instead, you push while standing up. This requires strength in your core, particularly the rectus abdomini, which works to provide anti-extension so your back doesn't just bend over backwards. If you're pushing with one arm, you'll also need to engage the obliques to prevent twisting too. You'll also need to drive power through the legs. And you'll use proprioceptors, the sensing cells of your muscles, to understand how much force you can deliver before falling over. Your body is performing complex maths that you aren't even aware of to keep you upright and deliver power in the right places. All of this factors into that mental model. This is important and often overlooked when it comes to virtuous, powerful movement. Perception is tied to that movement. In this case, the multifidus muscles that run up and down the spine are particularly dense with muscle spindles that sense changes in muscle length. Their job is often to prepare the body for incoming movements. This contributes to the individual's perceptual motor landscape. That is to say that the movement pattern must alter to accommodate the information coming into the brain. Lying flat on a bench removes those important data points, providing an incomplete model to work with. A martial artist sees how important the perceptual input is to the motor pattern when they block a punch without thinking. The same thing happens as we learn to catch our balance when we fall. Here the input is visual and proprioceptive. It's unhelpful to think of any of these signals as separate. We must marry the information coming through our eyes with the position of our head, communicated to us via these spindles in our neck. And in order to push with power from an upright position, you also need to practice reacting to the equal and opposite forces by stabilizing yourself in response to signals from your muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs. So what happens if you develop extremely powerful pecs and shoulders without the core to support them? And what if you aren't able to transfer that power to a real pushing movement because you've never practiced doing it? You've lost resolution in your motor perception. You're movement blind. The good news is that if you're performing a lot of skill training and you're using strength training to back this up, you will have the benefit of both components. I'm not saying then that one type of training is better than the other, or that there is no place for weightlifting movements or isolation movements in building a more performant individual. After all, we can't build as much strength in the pecs or shoulders specifically when standing up because of the bottleneck presented by the core and unstable position. I'm just saying you need both. The issue is when you only perform bench press and expect this to mean you can start pushing things around like the juggernaut. You will lack not only the core stability, but also the coordination and neural efficiency to transfer all of that available strength into the target. That's why those interested in real world performance should utilize movements like the cable press, band press, cable punch out, sled push, even car push.
there's another potential way in which the body adapts to the demands placed on it over time, and it's rather fascinating. Or fascinating, you could say. Fascia is the thin film-like structure that helps keep our organs and other structures in place. It wraps around everything, and through its dispersed tension called tensegrity, it helps to maintain our structure and absorb impacts. We now know that the fascia is also extremely dense with nerves, both proprioceptive and interoceptive. This full-body catsuit helps us to form a mental model of ourselves and to move gracefully through space. Moreover, it also contains muscle cells that may actually contribute to force production. And what's really interesting is the way it seems to join disparate muscles working toward a singular goal. This is called myofascial force transmission, and it may help us to better coordinate muscles that work together for greater force production, like they were one muscle. The next part comes as no surprise once you recognize the incredible adaptability of the human body. The fascia is capable of remodeling itself in response to training and environmental factors, which may in turn alter the way different muscle groups work together. Constantly use muscle A with muscle B, and they may eventually become physically linked as well as neurologically. According to Tom Myers, author of Anatomy Trains, fibroblast cells act like the architects of the fascial system, traveling through it and producing collagen and other chemicals needed to reinforce it as required. Perform the same movements over and over and your body will redesign itself to perform that movement. However, if you perform the movement too precisely, you may find you struggle to vary that movement significantly. As you can see then, we have these two powerful systems potentially adapting both to one another and the environment around them. That's not to mention all the other systems that adapt and respond in a similar manner, from fiber type composition to tendon hysteresis to fiber thickness, all self-organizing around the goal, the organism and the environment. And this is where psychology graduates may be raising their hands. What I'm describing here is the dynamic systems theory of motor learning, as described by Esther Ellen. This is also sometimes referred to as dynamical systems theory. The key phrase here is self-organizing. This is the term often used to illustrate the way that multiple systems within the body are able to adapt to the demands placed on them. In dynamic systems theory, these demands are called constraints and are usually listed as organism, environment, task or goal. In other words, the precise mechanics of a movement are the result of the individual's goals and environment as much as their own movement patterns and biological features. A good coach should understand this and seek to create interventions that rely on all three factors. Often this is achieved through the use of external cues, rules and tasks that reframe the drills that the athlete participates in. Squatting becomes squatting while throwing and catching a medicine ball. These are referred to as teaching games for understanding. Keep in mind that a lot of what we've discussed here is theoretical. Dynamic systems theory is just one theory in a sea of models of motor learning. I'll discuss more in future. Likewise, fascia is a very hot topic right now, but it is an area that requires a lot more research before it should inform training decisions to a large degree. Traditionally, fascial remodeling is not discussed in the context of these motor learning models, but I've attempted to connect the dots here, so take all this as conjecture. That said, there is certainly enough evidence and enough logical argument to say that we need varied and challenging movement in order to develop true coordination, neural efficiency and functional performance. These ideas should be married with tried and true training methods. Yes, use squats and isolation movements to build stronger legs, but also practice using those legs as part of the larger system, running, jumping and pushing. Use rote repetition to master movements like kicks, throws and lifts. But once you've reached a certain level of expertise, introduce the unexpected. Perform the movement on a hill, use a different form of resistance, stand on one leg or get someone to throw something at you. Train with cables, sandbags, medicine balls, kettlebells and club bells. These also have the benefit of creating movements that are slightly different every time you perform them. This is what is sometimes described as repetition without repetition, a term coined by Soviet neurophysiologist Nikolai Bernstein. In other words, a basketball player should not just practice shooting hoops from a comfortable static position. They should also practice shooting those hoops from the wrong leg while being jostled or when tired. As described by general motor program and schema theory, this can help to form more robust mental models, movement patterns that are more broadly generalizable to a variety of different situations. Interestingly, this is an argument slightly against Bruce Lee's 1000 kicks. Though to be clear, there is definitely benefit to rote repetition, particularly during the learning phase. Again, it's about combining methods. Try not to view your mind and body as separate entities. Recognize the role of perception and goals in defining movement. Turn training into play. Be mindful of your senses and keep the body guessing. All this will also help to keep your body more plastic and changeable. The more you learn, the better you become at learning. And all genetic differences aside, 
If you give two people the same training program, it is the most plastic athlete that will develop the most impressive performance. So hope you found this video useful and interesting, guys. If you did, then please leave a like and share it around. That helps me out immensely. Uh, comment down below and let me know what you think about all this. Do you incorporate challenges like that into your own training? How are you going to apply these ideas during workouts? Subscribe if you want much more like this. And if you want a training program, an ebook that's designed around this kind of philosophy, then be sure to check out Super Functional Training in the description down below. That's my ebook and training program. And there's a big discount on right now whilst we're in lockdown. Hope you guys are all keeping safe. Thanks so much for watching this one. And I'll see you next time. Bye. For now.